Hi everyone, version 2.2 of Afterglow is now available for Blender. So this update is available on Gumroad and Superhive and it includes a bunch of display case presets. So these are display case objects of various sizes. For example, some are very small and thin. There's an example of one with a pedestal as a base and one with glass shelves included. And some of them are much larger, which will fit into the studio environments in Afterglow. And these can be used in all different kinds of creative ways, which you'll see in this video. Now, instead of doing a regular, hey, this is what's available in the update, I'm just going to try something a bit new in this video basically while I was working on the update I recorded short clips basically explaining what I was doing at the time or what I was thinking and some of these include just general tips for blender so artistic tips and tricks as well as some context for how the update was made which means it's kind of much more condensed in information than what I would usually do so let me know what you think the rest of this video will basically be a series of these clips put together but remember if you want to try this out for yourself then head on over to Gumroad or Superhive and pick up Afterglow although just to give you a fair warning on the 28th of November November, Superhive will be starting a cyber sale and I will match the discount on that on Gumroad as well. So if you want to get it now, if you can't wait and you want to support me a bit more, then that's fine. You can grab it now. But if you want, you can wait for that sale. So I'm just letting you know because I know some people really care about that. Anyway, enjoy the video and I'll see you at the end. The Afterglow Lighting Asset Library for Blender is really starting to turn into something special. We're now up to version 2.2, which includes the display cases update, which is what we're seeing here. We're inside of the large X shape display case, which is itself within Studio Environment 6. One thing I like about how I've designed these physical spaces is that everything is interchangeable. So we can swap out the different types of studio environments with other elements like the display cases and see how the lighting results change. Now, obviously, this can be a bit demanding in cycles, but I've always taken the approach with this that we go for artistic freedom first and then optimization second. Interestingly as well, one of the things I noted when originally releasing Afterglow is that we can also technically use it as an HDRI generator. We can generate an infinite number of studio type HDRIs. And if you did that, you are perfectly welcome to sell whatever HDRIs you make with the toolkit. So scrolling down, we have studio environments one to seven. We've got studio cages, which are more for dioramas. They're basically lighting setups surrounding a single point. And in the previews here, you can see them surrounding a sphere. Let me actually turn one of those on. So I'm inside of Studio Cage 9 now, and I can swap through the different numbers and you can see the different reflections going on. I can even show you in the solid view how the lights are set up over these different cages. On top of this, there are product platforms. One thing I like about the product platforms is they are like spatially set up to not require studio environments around them, but to be enhanced by them. So again, in theory here, imagine a perfume bottle sitting there with or without the surrounding environment, there is still lighting within the product platform that provides detail. So inside of here, we can see that we've got two invisible ring objects and here I can move them around, rotate them, etc., recolor them, do all sorts of shader fun stuff with that. Additionally, there are pre-made materials, which may be useful for different types of objects. Obviously, this depends on the type of object and what sort of display is being used. Also, we have a large collection of what I call light shapes. So these are basically reflection objects. That's one way to think about them. If we drag them in, it will act as a plane. So we can see the plane here. It is a light source and the reflection will be visible in the object. So I dragged in this crosshair one and we can see the crosshair there on the object. If I open the shader editor, I can control the strength. If I put that up to something like 300, then it'll be much stronger. You could also modify the color there. Maybe I'll do that quickly. So if I mix that with like light blue, and I've got a light blue crosshair. So I've spent, as you can tell, quite a long time building Afterglow and it continues to grow with every update. It is all based on physical lighting. There may be exceptions in the future where lamp objects are needed for certain types of lighting, but for now, this is all that's needed. Another important feature specifically for the studio environments is the ability to swap out the image source for the lighting, either on the ceiling, the floor or the walls, depending on the actual environment. As this environment is a one by two aspect ratio for the ceiling, I can go to the one by two light patterns and in the ceiling object, I'm looking for the studio mapped ceiling light. And in here, the nodes are a bit messy, but down in the one by two ceiling image section, I can choose any one of these image patterns. So maybe I'll do the one by two straight lines, random thin. I'm going to pass the flip direction color as the vector input. And then I'm going to take that node and I'm going to plug the color in to the color of the principled BSDF. And we'll see that the ceiling light has changed to that. I can modify the light strength if I wanted, but generally the type of image defines how much light will be projected into the scene. So if you think about it in terms of surface area, if we go for a light shape 
that has quite a lot of surface area, like this light text. So plug in the color, let's drag that up and plug that into the color. Then that's obviously going to light the scene more because we have more surface area being represented. And so from here, anything you put in the scene will be reactive to that lighting. And that's one of the things that's really fun about it. The more you use the tool, the more you realize that the possibilities are just endless for lighting variety. For the display cases update for Afterglow, I have designed a variety of different shapes and sizes of display cases. They follow the same consistent style, so they are cubic, although some of them have like corners to them or X shapes. And the lighting in this initial version is pretty much the same all the way through, so they're very thin strips of light. And the reason I've done this instead of a different kind of shape is because I already knew I wanted to do some kind of corridor-like aspect to the lighting, and just having the thin bars like this makes it easy to drag them along, which helps you to highlight horizontally different areas of whatever you have inside of the cases. So there's two ways of thinking about their use. One of them is for demonstration purposes, as in having something physically in there to move around and display whether it's a product or a prop or like any other kind of object you like. We have tall ones where they're mostly glass and there's like pedestal one where it's on a platform. Again, as the initial version, it's all exactly the same style, like a kind of contemporary and very minimal. You will also notice that I've got sphere in the default collection assets and this is partly for creating the thumbnails if I scroll down so this is in the afterglow asset library we can see the thumbnails for the different display cases here and though it's kind of hard to interpret because they are mostly transparent you can see that some of them especially these ones with the larger shapes have multiple spheres in them of a small size so you can kind of intuit that these are larger display cases compared to the first ones in the list these are collection assets so they can just be dragged in and added to the scene and then adjusted as needed especially if you press Control A and then make instances real to unpack the collection asset, depending on whether it's already linked or appended, there's some caveats to the way things are imported in Blender. So this is all physical lighting inside of the Cycles rendering engine, meaning the lighting is coming from the emissive shaders on the light objects. If I enable some 3D scans here, you can see some demonstrations. Especially here, you can see that being able to control the position of a basic strip light actually has quite a significant effect over the lighting of objects. Something interesting I noticed when working on these display case lighting tools is that when bringing in scans from real life objects, it's always been a little bit tricky in the past bringing in the original texture data because scans from different areas have such different lighting conditions or the quality of the camera slash like the contrast, the different values used that end up generating the texture in the end will produce things which are a bit uncanny. For example, if I enable the original texture on this one and the one in the background, you'll see that though it looks interesting, there's something just a bit off about them. This one's a bit weirdly shiny. This one seems a bit overexposed. But I had an idea because recently I've been working on a physical material in Blender, a procedural material that will work on like any procedural object and it will look good no matter what. So this is an example of an output from that. You see it highlights the curvature, it looks fine. It's very monochrome, but you can color it. So one way to think about this is that this is already like the perfect digital space material in a way. It's perfectly compatible with the environment. So we got something that comes from the real world and is not really compatible and then something that is compatible and then it literally just crossed my mind i was like wait why not blend them so there are two ways to do it one is by straight up mixing them but what i've done here is i just darkened it so darkened it but passing the procedural one as an input and you'll see what it does it kind of adds like a dirt layer but at the same time it muffles the original texture and in some way, I think that brings the original texture into something that's more compatible with the environment space. And we can do the same thing with the face over here. So we've got the original texture and then blended with the procedural and it mellows it out. And I think they're now more suitable for the environment. Now these are using different techniques. So while this is a basic mix, this is a darken, but I can show you what this looks like if mixed. Then if we bring it back to like 0 0.5, you'll see it loses color. But again, it's just like a basic gradient between the two things. And if you look at it with a fresh set of eyes, it is more suitable for the environment. So I think there is something in there, something useful as a technique where we can combine the original sources with procedural techniques to try and make things more suitable for renders. Or I don't necessarily want to say more realistic because it's not actually realistic, but it would be perceived as more realistic for the space. All right, for all the lighting nerds out there, I think you might enjoy this. 
So I've got an X shape, very, very large display case situation going on here, like a museum thing. And along the top, I have strip lights. And these are effectively just like templates. I'm experimenting with doing different kinds of mapping for the lighting. There's a lot of work to do there, but you know, you could substitute this for any kind of pattern of light that you wanted. But one of the reasons why I love physical simulations of light like this, like in cycles, is just because of the creative variety. And I think that this dinosaur creature here from Sketchfab is a good example of seeing that variety because we can get different moods very quickly and highlight different areas. So the eye is drawn to wherever the light is the strongest. If you want to kind of like highlight the hip bone, we could do that. If you want to highlight the tail, easy. And it's just like a shortcut for drawing the eye to a new space. You could do some like differential color across the different lights and you know, focusing on different parts of the body, but I think that's fine. And also here I'm employing the technique of taking the original texture source from the 3D scan and then mixing it with my procedural shader, which I used to highlight curvature details. So what it does is it mellows out the original texture and then we get something that's like suitable for the pseudo liminal space of the museum environment. While working on the display case update for Afterglow, which includes creating a whole variety of different dimensions of display cases, you might think of them as like aspect ratios for physical spaces. I found it interesting how having like the physical context of an inner space, even within a larger environment, gives you a different perspective for like composition and angles because i find that even though these display cases are things that you would expect to look inside of to get interesting renders if you think of the cases themselves as like corridors internal environments then not only can you get interesting render shots looking from the outside in but you can also get interesting ones from the inside out if that makes sense so you could have things looking in through the glass or in this case we can treat it as a lighting domain from which to get really carefully constructed lighting on an object then we could do things for example if I scrub the lights at the top of the display case back and forth then we'll get some really fine control over that. I just have a quick tip for anyone working with assets in Blender or producing any kind of content pack in a Blend file that they might provide to friends or a studio or even sell online like I'm doing for Afterglow. Oftentimes when producing stuff in a Blend file I'm experimenting, I'm bringing in mesh assets from different files like photo scans to see how they work but before distributing this file to other people I need to make sure that that data is gone right so it's not unnecessary bloat or we don't have any like license conflicts where say like a 3D scan an object that shouldn't be shared because the license doesn't support it is accidentally included in the file. So what I do is I have a separate tab in the blend file that I call file content. And from here I can analyze all the content within the file. So we've got materials, images, meshes, etc. So the way you get to a view like this is by opening an outliner editor. So it's just your regular outliner, which you're used to seeing on the right side in Blender. But in the regular outliner, while you're usually looking at the view layer, which shows you all your collections, what you can instead do is set it to Blender file. And this is going to give you a much more raw and low level look at the content inside the file. Because here's the thing, obviously when you delete things from the blend file, like meshes, if they're no longer used, one thing that you can do, and I know a lot of people already know this, you go to file, clean up, and then purge unused data. From here you have options to delete things recursively, which is useful, which means that dependencies will be checked. And then if there's anything that's still loose, not being used, it will remove that as well. Before the recursive option, we used to have to run this operation several times, but some things can still get left behind. That's because you may have associations in the file that you didn't realize were still active, or you might have flagged a material, for example, with the fake user, which means it will stay in the file. So basically that's one more step I do before distributing the file is I just look through the content and I keep an eye out for anything that's suspicious. You will have an intuition for the kinds of naming conventions you use. And in the case of things like 3D scan objects, it's quite often the case that they have very hyper specific names that are, you know, a bit different or out of the ordinary. Now it would be nice to have more advanced like file checking features in Blender. And I know there are some add-ons that help with that as well, but I just think this is one important thing to keep in mind if you're developing asset files. Even for yourself or again to share with other people. Okay, so Afterglow version 2.2 of the display case update is now ready for me to upload. But I just want to make a note that the files that are downloadable on Gumroad and Superhive are zip files representing, you know, each version. 
So I'm opening Afterglow using 7-zip, although you can use any program that deals with compressed folders. I mean, by default, a lot of operating systems already should be able to handle them. Now, a lot of people might mistakenly think that this folder is the asset library, but actually this zip file contains a folder, which has the same name, and inside that folder is basically the asset library content. Now, this includes the text files, which define the categories for the asset library. So that may be confusing, but it's just one thing to keep in mind. So basically, again, I open that zip file and then I extract the folder contained inside of it. And then from here, this folder of Glue v2.2, or it's represented by an underscore, this is the asset library. So this is the directory I want to take. When I go to edit, preferences, file paths, we're going to press add to add an asset library. And then I pasted the directory in the top bar there. So now we're looking inside of that folder, even though we can't see the content because it's hiding regular files. But if I take all of these, you'd actually be able to see them. So with this folder selected, we go add asset library. Then if I opened the asset browser, then go to Afterglow v2.2, you'll be able to see all the content here from which it can be dragged into the scene. So yeah, that's now available. Consider going and picking it up. All right, I've just finished working on the display case update for Afterglow. So I'm in a basic scene here. I've got my modular workspaces add on here, which helps me to unpack collection assets. So let's see, Afterglow V2 display cases. What I'm going to do first is actually just grab a studio environment and I'm going to use Studio 6 because I've been using that for testing. Now the import methods changed with recent versions. So modular workspaces can't use the regular appending method. Let me do instance collections when appending. There we go. I wanted to center and unpack. Unpack that. Okay, that's fine. What about display cases? So the smallest one, let me increase the thumbnail size. How's that going to fit in? That's centered. That's good. Let's undo that. Next one, centered. Third. Okay, that's not exactly centered, so maybe I want to adjust that in the file. Same thing here. So this is just basic testing. Okay, they all drag in fine, especially this big one. Are the spheres included? Yes, they are. That's good. The L shape and the X. So a note to self is to have the center adjust to the actual center of the display case objects. Now what about unpacking them as collection assets? Do that, that's fine. All of the content is unpacked and organized. If you don't want to use an add-on like modular workspaces to unpack things, then a couple of things to keep in mind. Number one is we can use the append import method and not have it as an instance. So when you drag it in, all of the uh, objects will be automatically there and included. And that's probably what you want to do for a display case object because there's no real need to center a display case object on the world. And if you want to move it all, just right click on the collection and do select objects and then you can move it around all at once. So I think that's fine to work with. And this looks really good, actually. You see, I get excited. I, I get distracted when I see something cool. I think, oh, let me put something there and play around. So it looks like it imports fine. I just need to adjust the center points. Although if you're watching this, then the Afterglow display case update is now available. So you can grab that on Gumroad and Superhive. Thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you did, please put some kind of a light bulb related emoji in the comments. That way I can see who you are. So thank you and have a great day.